Okay, so hello to everyone. And we are here today for a great event, the second of the four events about women in biotech. And today we will talk about making a change with a great inspiring leader, Marissa Fire, who is a founder of her Health EQ and Fire Consulting, an executive in medtech field with uh, many years experience all around the world, developing women health and biotechnology industry in general. Marissa is one of the most inspiring women I have ever met and uh, I'm really following her professional career. And I really believe that all of us can learn a lot about biotech about being a woman leader from uh, Marissa today. So, uh, hello, Marissa. Hi, how are you? Great, great to see you. Great to see you. Okay, Marissa, so um, please uh, introduce yourself and tell us your story today. We are very eager to hear Thanks so much, Monica. And uh, I guess I'll uh, just do a little share screen here. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. And, and I'm so excited to be here today. And uh, I'm in New York City, so I wish I was with you guys today. Unfortunately, uh, hopefully next year we can do that, but not this year. And uh, thanks, Monica, for, for the intro. and. So I'm the founder and CEO of Her Healthy Q, and we're a social global uh, enterprise. It's a nonprofit, um, nonprofit for-profit mix, and we're focused on women's health in non-communicable diseases in the developing world. I'm also the president of Fayer Consulting. It's a global advisory firm, uh, which helps life science companies really grow and innovate. And so the one thing I definitely have to say is that my path was not typical. Um, and not, I did not plan from, from where I wanted to, to be to, to where I am today. And so, and there's so much more in the future that I still want to do. Um, so this is certainly not the, the end all be all, um, but I certainly never planned this. And I realized if I planned this 30 years ago, uh, it probably wouldn't have looked like this. So uh, I just, you know, want to make sure that everybody understands everything doesn't have to be really planned out, but you'll get to the right spot. Um, and so for me, what I really wanted to do was, uh, was to be an astronaut. And I still do. And so I trained at Space Camp, I trained at Space Academy, and I was always really focused on um, becoming an astronaut. But unfortunately, I didn't have great eyesight. Uh, and years ago, they did not allow contact, uh, contact lens wearers to go into space. So uh, that, you know, it really required me to kind of think about what I wanted as my next dream. But I still wanted to really be committed to the, to the industry and to work at NASA and all those things. I also, unfortunately, did not want to join the military um, uh, because they had bared clothes, they had haircuts, it just wasn't interesting to me, especially as, a, as an 18 year old, uh, you know, living in New York. So um, I decided to do, attend engineering school and I was really good at science and math. It felt like natural education choice for me. And so I started as an aerospace engineering student. And then I quickly realized how theoretical that was. And um, I was not doing well in school, honestly. And so I changed my major to manufacturing engineering and apparently that was where I was supposed to be because I loved it. I also interned at several different aerospace companies and then the industry is really cyclical. And so if I was ever caught in a downturn, I realized that it wouldn't be a career, like a great career move for me. And so I kind of didn't think about what industry to be in. I interned at a shoe company. I interned you know, at, at you know, space companies and different types of companies. And then I was very lucky. And what happened, what happened after, med, after um, graduation is that I was hired into 
a medical device med tech company. Um, didn't really even know about the industry. I just thought, oh, okay, this is a really interesting industry. It's always growing. It's always innovating. It was always in demand and uh, it was always busy. So I thought career-wise, like that was a great idea. Um, and I also thought that I would be helping people and I'm not a doctor. And so how else can I help, you know, help the world, help the economy, not in a very altruistic way, in a very, I'm going to be busy. So I'm gonna always have a job. And so what I did was um, I moved really methodically through my career. I was an engineer. I was a senior engineer. I went to a project leader, became a manager, director, VP. I just kept on moving up the corporate ladder. Um, and I also obtained my MBA when, um, when I was working full time. And I worked for companies such as, you know, McKay Getting, Olympus Medical, Hologic, Acumed. Um, and so I spent a lot of time just in the med tech industry. I continued to always take on more and more responsibility. And I worked on more high profile projects because I really wanted to obtain the visibility for what I was doing. I wanted to be the COO. I wanted to keep going up um, because I thought that that was how I could really have a lot of influence and I can live this great life. And, uh, and, and that's what kind of I was supposed to do. And so I kept on taking more high visibility projects and ones that probably typical engineers didn't, didn't think of, and maybe it was back then, uh, I, I'm not gonna age myself certainly, but you know, things were different uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. And so traditional engineers didn't want to take on a lot of different types of jobs. And, and I did because I asked for them. I worked on mergers and acquisitions and integrations all throughout the US. I worked on facility mergers and, and, and closures throughout the country. I worked as the lead in the development of new technologies. I created um, with the entire team at one of the companies I was working for, Hologic, the, 3D, the first 3D mammography system. And it was the first one in the world. I mean, that's, that's one of the most exciting things that you could be on is a, is a brand new technology that you know is really gonna help, you know, help people and, and, and help the women. And I worked on international projects and even relocated to other countries for over four and a half years. And this is, that's not something that a lot of people do. And I think it's a, a lot more common, quite honestly, in Europe um, than in the US. But in the US, it's not very common for, you know, for, for us to relocate to other countries to take on better job opportunities. And so, um, I did that. I did that because number one, it was really exciting um, and it was nice to kind of get to do something else. And number two, it was a huge opportunity. And so I spent four and a half years in Costa Rica, in Canada and the Dominican Republic. And even before that, I was traveling throughout the US um, and Asia a bit for, for three years before that. So um, from my perspective, I always just asked for more. I knew that I had to be better and I had to work harder. And unfortunately that was because I was a woman and I didn't like that I had to work more, but I just understood that it was a reality of the industry. And, and at that time, and I think still uh, and of the world. And as I said, my pathway was to become the CEO of a large life science company. And then I became downsized through, through a repatriation back to the US. And, and you know what? It was fine. I was so burnt out from constantly fighting this corporate ladder for 15 years. And um, I just, you know, things were just different back then. Things were, I was always fighting. There were less opportunities for, to be creative and to have different ideas and to maybe create your own pathway. Um, so I thought, like, why not start consulting? You know, I thought it was really like an easy thing to do. Um, and everybody suggested it to me. And I mean, honestly, I think they assumed that I was going to go into a consulting firm. Uh, I took it a different way and decided to start my own consulting firm. And I had great experience and I had a lot of value. 
Um, but it's really hard. You know, I can definitely say it's really hard. I've had my consulting firm open for over five years. It's still hard. It's, it's, it gets better. And, and, you know, through a lot of experience, it's, it's a lot easier. But starting a consulting firm is hard. Um, and I was lucky to work with a lot of great coaches. I was lucky to have people, you know, a little bit guide me on how to change my mindset from a very corporate perspective to, um, to more of a, you know, here's what I have to provide as, and value and, um, and really what I should be doing. Um, and listen, it all, like all of my career sounds really rosy and smart and, you know, that I thought it through and, and I, I didn't. I didn't think that much through. I think more about it now than I do than I did back then. Uh, maybe it was naivete or, or being young, but um, you know, I, I had to take on consulting projects that were not as advanced as I was doing in corporate. Um, I had to kind of do what the client asked and build up my my business and start my client base, and and then it just continues to grow. But. For me, the most pivotal life moment in my career and in my life just generally, it happened when I was in Costa Rica. And I was working and living in, in this Costa Rican um, subset of a huge multinational um, organization in the US, and it was a med tech company. Ironically, Costa Rica is one of the med tech hubs uh, in all of the world um, because it's really close to the US, but really, really smart. Um, an education system. So great, great industry to be in. And I created this new and exciting position that didn't exist. I went into my boss, I handed him a sheet of paper. Um, it was after some, some merger and acquisition diligence. And I said, I'm moving to Costa Rica and this is what I'm doing. And I just, I took it as an opportunity because I knew that this, like, I wasn't going to get another one of these again. And I, this was with a company that has never sent anybody abroad to work as an expat. Um, I was completely a guinea pig. Uh, I, I handed my position to say, this is what I'm doing. And three weeks later, I moved. I didn't learn Spanish. I didn't know Spanish. Uh, I didn't know where I was going to live. Um, you know, I just showed up at the office and here I was. Uh, thankfully, things have gotten a lot better since then. But, <laughs> but you know, I, if I was going to be if anybody had to do it, let it be me. Let it be me who is the guinea pig who can take on this exciting new opportunity. And, and for me, it was the career accelerating professional role that like I knew I had to take and that I wanted to take. And then the other best thing happened. A conversation in a bar with a friend of mine absolutely changed my life. And I know... I mean, all great ideas do happen in a bar, so it is kind of ironic. Um, but the fact that, like, I was sitting with a friend of mine in Costa Rica after work, and she was just telling me about all of these women dying of breast cancer in this really in this specific region in Costa Rica. Their death rates were over ten times higher than the rest of the country, and it was really just discovered that they were dying because. Um, breast cancer detection equipment, their mammography equipment was broken. And it broke down for years before, which, I mean, if you remember two minutes ago, I worked at a breast cancer manufacturing company. It's what I did for a living. And one that actually makes this specific equipment that they needed. And so I knew we had equipment and I knew we had extra equipment. And it was returned from customers who purchased, you know, newer models or um, in our wasteful society in the U.S. if it has a scratch on it or something like that. And, um, you know, we had some sitting in the warehouse. There was also 500 employees working in the factory in Costa Rica that I was working in. So I just thought to myself, why should we not give back to the country in which we're, we're living in and we're working in and we're doing so well in? And... We should just support where we work. And so all the stars aligned and with a lot of help and a lot of work um, with our corporate offices, with a, a local NGO, a coast, the Costa Rican government, the US embassy, the local hospital, where all of this is happening, 
Um, I coordinated and facilitated the donation of a mammography machine to the main hospital um, in the region to replace the one that broke down years ago. And um, we even had to like dig trenches. I mean, you can physically see that there. <laughs> and then, um, and we need to, to put power lines, you know, special power lines in, and, and it was quite the undertaking. Um, but within one year, the death rate because of breast cancer decreased so dramatically. And now it's back down to the country average, which was over 10 times lower than when we started. And, and it's still being used, which I think is really just exciting. And we st I still get data from it and I still hear about it. And so, you know, I kept working after that. To me, that was a, it was a project. It was something fun and that I fun that I worked on, and I was really proud of it. And then there was something that was just always bothering me about it and wanting to do more. And I just thought how unfair the whole situation was. And um, you know, there's all of this excess equipment in countries in med device companies, and there's people who need it. But for me, I thought that to be taken seriously, I mean, I had to keep getting that C-level position. I had to keep growing. I had to keep working. I had to keep going. And I needed to stay in corporate. I honestly, I didn't have that many mentors when, when I was in the industry. Um, and I didn't have people to guide me to tell me what to do. A lot of people told me, keep going. You know, you're going to be the, the CEO. Keep going. Keep working. Keep working for the rest of your life. Keep doing it. And I didn't have people to tell me how to do it, how to do things differently, how to get different positions to get to what I wanted. I always had people challenging me. Uh, I think that was probably because I was a woman doing things differently, um, or they saw the potential, or both. And um, you know, after I left corporate life, I, I continued my consulting firm. I just kept thinking about that donation in Costa Rica. And it was really important to me. Um, and then just one day, I just decided to do something. I couldn't keep thinking about it. I had to actually do something. So I decided to fill the gap between this excess equipment and the people who really need it. I was always passionate about girls in STEM programs and science and technology. And I was always really excited about girls going to school regardless where they lived, in the US, in Europe, in Africa, in Latin America, anywhere. Girls should go to school. I still feel that way. I will work my entire life until every girl is in school. But to me, it was really important. But there's a lot of organizations that help girls go to school. Um, but the real reason that, like, that struck me, that was interesting, exciting, was that they weren't going to school in these developing countries because they were taking care of their families. And I investigated it more and it was the girls who were being pulled out of school first when their mother was sick, their aunt was sick, their grandmother, their sister. When somebody was sick or died, it was the girls being pulled out of school to take care of their families, not the boys. And they're seen as caregivers. So for me, I didn't think that was fair honestly. Um, and I just, in order for these girls to go to school, I mean, we had to get their mothers, their grandmothers, their aunts, their, you know, everybody in their family healthy. And in the developing world, 90% of a woman's salary goes back as an investment into her family. And that's compared to 40% of, of a man's salary. This investment, it creates a one generation cycle of development with the increase of status and fortune and betterment of their families and the region as a whole. And so without this diagnosis of treatable issues, women are not gonna be able to increase their region's status. And they can't break the cycle of poverty and this inequality just continues. I just personally was familiar with the women's health space because, because that's the industry that I was working in. I spent nine years of my career 
at a women's health company. I didn't choose it. I just, it was a great job. I went there. I happened to love it. And it meant something to me. And, and after all of this research, I just, I knew I had to focus on the unique thing that I knew that I can do. So I started her health EQ and I was familiar with medical equipment. I knew it would be a great place to start. It was my network. It was the, it was the people that I knew. It was the industry I knew. And they say that you're supposed to start with what you know. So I started with what I knew, medical devices. I didn't know the pharmaceutical space. It was really hard to get into. And it was really crowded. There's a lot of people deploying um, uh, pharmaceuticals all throughout the world. I also really, I discovered that organization, there's not that many organizations that focus on non-communicable diseases and that most of them, if not all, can be either detected, prevented, or treated with medical devices and equipment. So it made sense to, to start, again, in what I knew. And these NCDs they, that affect women, there's so many of them, but, but what we focus on and just generally some of the biggest ones that can be treated and detected and diagnosed with equipment are breast, cervical, lung, and skin cancers, heart disease, diabetes, um, and maternal health. And the fact that NCDs are the largest contributing factor of deaths in women in the developing world. And it accounts for 70% of women's deaths globally. They're almost always detectable and so many of them are preventable. So I knew I had a little bit of a market niche. Um, and what our mission is, is, you know, our vision is, is a world where Healthcare is accessible to everybody. We have the goal of impacting the lives of 1 million women by 2025 and just further growth after that. Our mission is to improve women's health in developing countries by providing access to medical device equipment. And this creates an equitable standard of care. We focus our resources on the detection, prevention, and treatment of the top non communicable diseases you know, that really affect women. And we focus in the developing world. And we work hand in hand with partners to, to deploy this equipment, to ensure that it gets used, and we create opportunities. And what we do is, it, it, it seems really simple, but there's not that many people doing it, quite honestly. And there's nobody focused on this in, um, you know, in the way that we are. And so we procure the equipment from these medical device manufacturers. And then we ensure that it's administered by, by healthcare centers who really need it. And, but they tell us exactly what they need. We're not filling up a container of equipment and just shipping it somewhere and hope that some of it gets used. We're working very specifically on programs with partners and we as an organization do not put our teams in the field. We work with people who already have that. It's a developed industry. Why, why would we replicate it? But these organizations, even these large organizations, they can't get the equipment. So, I, I mean, it's literally the industry <laughs> that I'm in and, so, um, and, and that my board is in. And so what we do is we work with these local clinics. They tell us what they need to help women's health issues which can either be significantly reduced or eliminated if they had this equipment. And we work with the medical device manufacturers to secure the donations of either new or refurbished equipment. These medical device manufacturers, they have this wasteful system of storing older versions of completely working machines. They collect dust in a warehouse and they just sit and they're idle and nobody uses them. And what we do is we put them to use. These manufacturers then, they receive a huge tax write-off, great press exposure, and they just have a better conscience. And you know they don't want this equipment sitting in their, just sitting in their warehouses. One of the saddest parts is that $765 billion of medical equipment is thrown away each year in the US. At least 40% of that 
equipment is durable medical equipment that's fully functional. And it's just been thrown away to make room in a warehouse or of a marketing change, such as like a new logo, a new color scheme, a merger with a new name. And these cosmetic imperfections don't affect the function of a, of a piece of equipment. So if just 10% of that equipment could be repurposed, millions of lives could be saved. So we have started, we've, we have many programs throughout the world. In Jamaica, we have a maternal health programming um, program to monitor maternal health. And we also have a cervical cancer detection program. In Vietnam, uh, we have three programs for the detection of cervical cancer. In Tanzania, we have a program for the treatment of cervical cancer. And in Burkina Faso, in Africa, we have um, a program for the detection of cervical cancer. We had a lot of programs planned for this year, but uh, we all know how that goes. So um, <laughs> our, uh, our program in India, which is a 30 site uh, program for the detection of breast cancer has been postponed until 2021, uh, but we're, we're ready. We have everything we need. We just uh, we need COVID to go away. Uh, honestly, just like everybody else does. And, um, but that's gonna be a huge impactful program. It's 30 different sites. Uh, we also plan to launch a program in Costa Rica where this whole idea started um, for the detection uh, and, and treatment of lung cancer, cervical cancer, breast cancer, and skin cancer. It was at a, a new cancer center, which had to be postponed because of uh, its opening because of COVID. And so we're just postponing that program for a year. We're planning a maternal diabetes program in Mexico. Uh, we're planning an HPV and, and cervical cancer detection program in Kenya. And a really interesting turn that just uh, got decided actually two weeks ago um, is that within the next few months, we're hoping to launch a diabetes or heart disease program in the US. And um, we're all focused on women, only focused on women. And we wanna ensure that women have access to high quality medical care and treatment. And so, oh, we um, women are disproportionately affected by NCDs. And this is because they're near carcinogenic materials such as cooking coal, or they're being outside in the sun um, with less cover on their skin. There's societal norms where women are just not valued as high as men. And they're seen as replaceable and not worthy of having money spent on their health care. And just generally the lack of health infrastructure near and accessible to women in developing countries it, it are some of the reasons that women are so disproportionately affected. The time it takes for a woman to get a health screening or care is time away from her family or her money earning activities. And a lot of women, they make the choice of their family over themselves because they don't see the long-term value in their health. And there's disparity all throughout the world. And, I, and I'm not denying that in the least um, and including in developed countries, but there's still relative access to care and access to these services. And because the infrastructure could be there. In developing countries, infrastructure is not really available outside of the major cities. The other side of it is that NCDs are relatively new in a lot of these developing countries. So communicable diseases, malaria, TB, polio, um, you know, all of these diseases, that's what's being fought on the ground. And then once those are eradicated, everyone's healthy enough and they're living, living healthier lives, but then they're getting cancer and diabetes and heart disease because whether there's a little bit more money or whether there's just access to um, you know, a dif different types of food or you're just living longer and your body has, is creating cancer, unfortunately, that you were dying before and weren't, it was never developing. There's not enough equipment in all of these developing countries or equipment at all, quite honestly, um, to either diagnose, prevent, or treat these diseases. And the governments, they just don't have the money to equip every healthcare center. And so 
that's kind of what we work on. And so Her Healthy Q, we started as a traditional donation-based, very for free nonprofit, give the equipment away for free. And it was the only thing I knew of. Um, I'm not in the nonprofit space. I didn't know like how things worked. And um, I, but I came from a corporate background and, and giving stuff away for free just never made sense to me. We were, I was always, you know, as an organization, we were always asking people for money and in small amounts. And then I was always fundraising and it's, it took up, you know, and takes up my entire time. And I knew that there just had to be a better way of doing business. And, you know, I kept thinking that a nonprofit, it's a business too. It's just not one that makes money, you know, or it's one that doesn't make me rich. That's really the, the one differentiator. And so um, this year, Her Healthy Q, we transitioned into a social enterprise. We remain a nonprofit, but we're revenue generating. And um, we also have the ability to be invested in, which, you know, by, by impact investors, which everyone's really looking for. And it allows us to still raise capital from individuals and from grants and corporate donations and partners and sponsors, but it allows us to make the money on the work that we do to support our own organization and to support our, our own projects. And that's really exciting. Um, there's very few social enterprises, especially in the women's health space, um, and especially in, in the health space as well. And it allows us to spend a little less time on fundraising, just a little, because we're still always, as an organization, always fundraising, um, but more time spending time on projects, new programs, new, new geographies, new health indications. And it just means that we have time to spend on opportunities to help women have access to better health care. We get to pay our staff well. Um, nonprofits traditionally don't pay their staff well, and that's not acceptable to me coming from a corporation. And if, if we want to be the best, we need the best. And so we want to pay our staff. We want to expand like a regular company instead of just expanding and off the goodwill of others. And, you know, this allows us to control our own destiny and our future. And so impact is what we focus on most. It's our main metric of measurement. We want to impact the lives of more women around the world. And that just means more health for women. And, you know, it goes back to school for the girls, more economic advantages and opportunities for women, and more change to an equal and uh, equitable world. We're working to achieve that through health because wealth through health is how I see that changing. And these women, they deserve to have their health and they deserve to contribute to society and they deserve to send their girls to school. And, you know, for all of the reasons that I mentioned before and that I've been talking about and that I'm so passionate about, um, this is why women in the life science and biotech fields are so needed. They're so necessary. And I know that it's hard and I know that it's a challenge. I'm in it, I'm in it with you. I'm in it with everybody. But every single one of us, we can continue to change this industry. I faced discrimination. I faced innuendos. I had to continue to work harder than men do. And I know that there's still a lot of work that we have to do to make this industry better, but I know that we can do it together. I know, you know, that there's, you know, I, I know that I'm coming from a position of wealth as well. And I know that I'm, have it easier than others do. But, you know, we need everybody to do this together. To me, the life science industry, it's fun. It's rewarding. It's exciting. I mean, it's cool what we do. And it's really interesting. Innovation is happening in front of us every day. And we have the opportunity also to help other people. And we're on the front lines. And I don't want this to be very altruistic. It's also really lucrative. You know, you can make a lot of money. You can do well in this industry. And we're with some of the smartest people in the world. And this industry is always growing. We're the ones that are making real impactful change. So in my opinion, quite honestly, there is no other industry to be in. 
Um, ooh, no, just kidding. Um, but as women, we need to further infiltrate this life science innovation space. We need to be in executive positions so that we can drive equality within the companies that we work in. We need products that are worth developing and that can make an actual difference in our lives, you know, and make sense for us. We need products that are also tested equally on men and on women. Men and women have different health conditions. They, sh they present differently um, on how we react to drugs and devices. We also need policy change to make sure that everyone has equality and equity. We need people and companies to care about profits and they need to care about the world around them. And we also need innovation and new ideas. And women equally to men, if not more, in my personal opinion, um, you know, our thoughts are really important. And we are the ones that have the innovation. We see the gaps in this industry on what's not there and what needs to be solved for. And that's why we all have to continue in this industry. And we need to be in every area of the industry. It's not just, it's not just in the lab. It's not just, you know, it's not just in sales. It's not just in, in developing new products. Those are exciting, but we need, we need everybody in this industry. And it's, it's why I, I'm still in the industry. And so it's why I'm doing everything all at once. And um, I still consult almost full time. I run Her Healthy Q as a CEO and as a board member. I'm, I'm her healthy cues outward, you know, facing voice, um, speak and I write, I, I serve on other boards. I serve on three life science, uh, boards. Um, and for fun, I serve on a dance company board, you know, because you never know where, what connections are going to be there and, and how that's going to help in other ways. And it's just fun. Um, you know, I help companies grow as well. And, and for me, I also stay in innovation because it's interesting it's exciting, but I know that that's work that can also help her healthy cue in the future. And it keeps me fresh. I mean, it's, it's, a good, it's a good place to be. I work in developing countries and developed countries, and I keep my mind open for new ideas. And I think as people, and especially as women, that's what we need to do. We need to be really broad in our vision and narrow in our focus. So broad in doing all these different areas in different areas of health, but like in the life science space, we know that we want to make things better. We know we want a healthier world. So that's our narrow focus. And we need to be all in these multiple areas that are complementary to each other. We need to be in this industry because it's important, but this industry also needs us. It's not just us needing them. It's, it's both sides. And so, you know, as I've always said, I didn't intend to be in women's health. I, I didn't intend to be a women's health advocate as well. Like this was not, it was never an aspiration. I just very luckily fell into it. I, I'm sure I would have found my way there and it would have been great. But I think I was lucky to find it um, or it was really lucky to find me. And so, but I'm doing something to me that's personal and that I like, um, you know, it's women, it's health, it's opportunities. And, and, and I just put them together. That's what I did. And it was in the only logical way that I saw how. I know that there's other ways to put all of my experience together, all of what I am doing. There's, there's absolutely different ways to put that together. This is the way I see I could put it together. I used with knowledge and skills and experience I had and, you know, to approach it and attack it the way that I am. And I, I was looking for my, you know, as everyone says, your thing, you know, your passion. I knew I was always a little different. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily the traditional New York City woman. Um, I spend months in Africa at a time. Um, I am in the life science fields, which is only now up and coming in, in, in New York. Um, I had to move away from the city for so many years to, uh, to be in the industry. And, um, you know, I always wanted to be a little different, but I'm a proud woman engineer. I'm 
proud to be in mergers and acquisitions. I'm a woman who knew, moved to another country and, uh, and I'm a woman entrepreneur. And, and these are things that I never ever dreamt, dreamt about. I mean, I always wanted to be that astronaut. I couldn't have planned this. And the only similarities that I can ever see between the two industries is that they have to do with innovation. There's innovation, discovery, and helping find new ways of doing things in both the space industry and in, um, and in the life science industry. And so, I mean, I couldn't imagine doing, well, actually I could imagine doing many things other than this, but I, this is what I love. And so, you know, for everybody, you can, you can search for your purpose. It will find you, but if it doesn't, just create it. Create with, with what you have, with what you know, and with what you want your life to be. It only takes one of us to make a change. But imagine what we can all do together and what this world would look like if we work to make the change that we want. And in this life science industry, we can all do it together. It's individual, but we're together in this as a whole and in this industry. So um, thank you so much for having me. And uh, let's open it up for questions. Yes, Monica? Thank you, Marissa, very, very much. I really enjoy uh, listening to you and uh, hearing all these, uh, you know, great experiences that you had and, uh, you know, your uh, vision of life. And I really, uh, enjoy that at, at the end you said yes of course it, it comes you know with a small idea and if you remember a year ago i was very much talking about this woman in biotech and how yeah. to move it further and how to start by step by step um and um, after uh, i think less than a year we have this uh, great events and it's done together. It's done together with my great colleagues from Lithuanian Biotech Association, from uh, um, USA Embassy here in Vilnius with Thermo Fisher Scientific and uh, uh, Agency for Science, Innovation and Technology and also Vilnius University Life Sciences Center. So we like, you know, totally different organizations joined together. Uh, to do this event and, and having you talking about, you know, this um, uh, different uh, pieces of uh, life sciences industry that, that comes together to make really a change. So really, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, now time, time for questions. Um, uh, so first of all, uh, what I wanted to ask you is um, how, you already mentioned that you know the COVID situation is very much impacting you, and you are you. I know that you are a person who is like traveling all the time and maybe flying even more than a usual pilot does. Uh, uh, so how how do you feel now? I mean that impacted your uh, business, your uh, professional life, yeah. But uh, how, do you see any like? positive things from the, I mean, situation of COVID, not COVID itself, but the way how our life changed? Yeah, I mean, I was on 167 flights last year. So, uh, and, and literally almost every continent. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, I miss it. I kiss my passport at least once a week. I tell it I love it and I miss it. Uh, I take it for a spin around my apartment to, to get it out. Um, so, you know, I, I, COVID's really affected us as an organization and me personally, because it affects the work that we can do. And so that's a, a big issue. The, the only, well, there's a few positives, but the, one of the positives that I really see is that um, I've had the time to plan. I've had the time to sit down as an organization. We, I don't think that we would have drafted out and, and planned three or four different projects in one year. We just don't have the bandwidth to be able to do that. Um, so we've had the time to plan. Uh, myself as consultancy, I, uh, I'm grateful, but I'm busier than ever. And um, that's because there's a lot of innovation happening. 
Uh, I'm working with the National Institute of Health right now um, to, to get all these COVID diagnostic tests out. Um, I, I work with different companies that unfortunately some of them had to downsize um, and it's through mergers and acquisitions that that's happening. So there's still capital being raised. It's being very directed. So that's another positive is that through, through everyone being very focused, they're understanding what matters. And I hope in 2021, and, and, and I think everyone has seen this throughout this year, is that health is really important. And it's, it's not just the biggest, newest innovations, but health's really important. And so um, we need to invest in it. We need to have new ways of doing things. And, um, it, it, you know, it's not, it's sometimes not the, the fanciest. Um, all of a sudden, all of these really innovative companies were making ventilators in their garage. And um, how do we support companies like that? So I think a lot of people have started to see that. Um, so I, I hope out of all of this, a lot of innovation is happening. And, um, and for, for me personally and, and, and for my businesses, uh, it's created a lot of focus. But, uh, but I do have to say, I am ready to get out of my apartment in New York City and, um, <laughs> and start getting on an airplane. But uh, we'll only do so when it's safe. Yeah, definitely. We will do that. But yeah. sometimes we can, uh, you know, uh, wait a little for the benefit of the whole society. It's just several years. Um, and we have um, some uh, questions from the audience, which I really uh, feel that they are very interesting and to the point. So um, one of them is, uh, you know, it's really a challenging thing that you are doing and all this um, nonprofit. And now I really enjoyed the, the idea that you are turning it to social enterprise. But the question is, were there uh, like those uh, hard moments or the moments where you thought that, oh no, it's, it, I, I cannot do that anymore and it's enough, I'll, I need to do something else. Uh, have you faced the situation? Every day, every single day. If, if people say that it's easy, it's not. Um, as an organization, we, you know, I'm always constantly fundraising and this year it's been even harder and because all the money, and rightfully so, went to COVID. Um, it also went to racial injustice in the States. It went to natural disasters. And so, and a lot of people are preserving capital. So uh, every day, I, I wonder if we're gonna shut down. Um, and I have for years. And, and that's one of the reasons why we, we changed into a social enterprise so that in the future, we are creating our own destiny. Um, and it, every day is hard. Every day is hard as a consultant when you either get that project and it's really hard and challenging or you don't get that project and that, and that client, um, you have to figure out what to do next. So, uh, I mean, I, of course, I always like to talk about the positive, but every day is a struggle. And I, I think every day, I wonder if every day, you know, if the next day is going to be the day that it, it all comes crashing down. And I wonder if it's the day where uh, as an organization, we stop, and um, uh, there's this great saying, and I'll, I won't say it well, but the, you know, the day that you fail is the day that you stop. I'm just going to keep on going. And uh, whether it's me uh, alone or it's other people with me and we, I try to rebuild, it, it's, you just have to keep on going. And that's, um, that's what I just keep seeing. And it's hard. I mean, it's hard every day. I don't sleep very much. Um, I use a lot of under eye cream and, um, you know, it's, it's hard. So, so I don't want to certainly paint the, the, the really rosy picture of, of all of it. It's, it's hard and, and it's a struggle every single day. And I think uh, any corporation who doesn't think that it's hard uh, is fooling themselves because if you're, it just means that you're complacent. Yeah, I guess it's, uh, uh, this understanding that, you know, uh, life is hard is especially important to understand for a younger generation, which now seems that, you know, everything should happen like, you know, in a second. And uh, as long as they wish something, they, that should happen right away. Uh, yeah, which I see from my son. He's six years old and he doesn't want to struggle at all. But 
by the way, he had a great idea that, like you said, you wanted to be an astronaut and he's like, he's in front of the yeah. universe and so on. And I said, you want to be an astronaut? He says, no, no, it's really not so much interesting just flying there. I would like to contribute somehow like in a more sophisticated way, like being a scientist on a team, for example, and really to make uh, you know a change that we would fly not only let's say to the moon, but like, you know, to whatever, Jupiter or, or, or even, you know, other galaxies and so on, like, you know, I, I could make more change like, you know, in that. So uh, I believe you have the totally same uh, attitude, like really <laughs> making the change where it's needed the most. And we also have additional question. You already told it, you know, you, we as women have to be way better really to be appreciated and you know to to, to achieve uh, uh, the results and the recognition uh, and it's really a, a complicated of course question but what are the those like biggest challenges or, or the most complicated situations that you have faced like being a woman in this uh, a crazy world of uh, life sciences and, and big corporations and, and now, you know, like uh, startups and, and NGOs. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's plain and simple. It's being a woman. That's the hardest part. Um, and it, it's, it's the perceived notion that we are not good enough because we're a woman and that our ideas aren't good enough and smart enough. So I've been in I've been in boardrooms um, and, and pitching an organization uh, in, or, 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 you know, with a company and trying to raise capital. And they're like, well, you don't know about that. You're just a woman. I was like, we're, ta we're talking about a women's health company. Like, what do you mean? I don't know about this. You don't know about it because you're a man. Um, and, you know, so or dismissing my ideas because I'm a woman. And that's really hard. And it happens uh, multiple times a week honestly. Um, it, it, that's really hard. Um, I've been passed up for promotions when I was in corporate um, because, you know, I didn't need it as much because I was a woman and I wasn't supporting my family. Um, and that this guy really needed this job and the promotion and the, and the extra money because he has a family to support. It was my choice not to have uh, a family. It's, you know, it, I don't think that I should have been, you know, passed over for that when I was extra qualified for something. Um, so it has happened so many times. Um, you know, unfortunately the sexual innuendos um, early in my career, uh, you know, I had to look a certain way, I had to do a certain thing. Um, I never agreed with that. And um, it's less prevalent now, but it still exists. And, and I don't want to think that it's not uh, happening. So from, it exists. It exists every day. I think it's just hard being a woman. And we just know we have to be better. And I think that's the hardest part, honestly, that we have to work twice as hard for probably not as good of a result. Um, and I'm, you know, it's one of the reasons why I have men on my board. Some of the reasons I have men in my company. I believe in equality. I don't want this to just be women. And it shouldn't just be women. So I think that having both sides and, and it's, it's, it's interesting to have different perspectives and, but it has to be with men who are, who believe in this and are, uh, you know, believe in women, believe in my ideas equally to theirs, if not better. So it happens every day. I'm sorry to say that it does. And you just have to keep on going um, because if we don't keep on going, we failed. And this is how we're going to make the change in the industry, because we need to make this change in the industry. We need to change how people think about women, especially in life sciences. Yeah, it's really a very male dominated industry, especially in US. I really uh, feel like a very, uh, like really an odd person coming, uh, let's say to US and saying that, you know, I'm a CEO of a biotech company and it's like, what <laughs> you are a woman and you are young and uh, how how can it be uh yeah so it's really a, a lot uh, of things to do and a long way to go to change the situation 
But uh, Marissa, do you also believe in, in the thing that it also very much depends on the woman? Because, uh, well, my husband, he's uh, like more feministic than I am. And he's always saying, you are not enough feministic. You should be more confident. And he's coming from IT field and he's saying, I love to recruit uh, like um, uh, women developers because mm -hmm. you know why? They are at least 10 times better than men because they really have to work way harder to push through and, and you know, to finish the studies and go into career. So Marissa, do you believe that we really, it, I mean, it depends on us, on women, the more we push for it, uh, the more uh, I know we put effort, uh, the, the, you know, the faster the situation will change and, and we will have a, let's say a totally different uh, situation and attitude I don't know, in 10 or maybe at least well, 20 years. So for sure. Let's hope. Let's hope it's, it's 10 years and uh, at least, uh, you know, it better be changed in 20, but let's hope for 10. But I, I, I think it does depend on the woman. Um, and, and let's hope that there's more men in, in life like your husband. And, and that's what we need. But, it, you know, we it, as women, oftentimes we have to raise these men to be like that um, or we have to uh, you know, teach them to be like that too. And so I think that's important. And honestly, the more women that men see in the industry, it, it, there's no way that they can't not change. And if they can't change, then they're going to be phased out of the industry. They're going to be phased out of reality, quite honestly. So um, it does depend on the women and, and the woman itself, but the more that there are of us, the more that the industry is going to change. And so that's why, you know, I was saying it takes, it takes every single one of us and, and it's very individual, but every single one of us adds up to a lot. And so we need to be doing this together. We need to um, all be in the industry because that's how the change is going to happen. And um, we, we need to be there. And, and just like your husband said, and I firmly believe this, women are way smarter it's not, this is not man bashing. It's because we've had to work harder and we have to work harder and twice as much and longer hours and, you know, do all these other things in addition to what we're doing um, and in, in what we're doing at life and, uh, you know, family and at home and at work and because we're able to do it. And it, you know, if, if we weren't able to do it, it wouldn't be put on our plate, quite honestly. So, um, hundred percent. There needs to be more men like your husband. <laughs> well, yeah. So as I'm uh, joking, uh, you know, I'm in, in this gene engineering, so maybe I just need to make more copies of him. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, redistribute <laughs> uh, to, to our industry also. Okay, Marissa, thank you very much. And I would like now to also invite my Lithuanian colleagues to join us for discussion to um, great Lithuanian leaders, uh, Daina Klepone and Lina Jankovskaite. Hello, Daina. Hello, Lina. Uh, so uh, Daina is Managing Director of Enterprise Lithuania, the agency which is... Uh, um, which aims to promote uh, entrepreneurship, business development and uh, exports and, and really contributes greatly to growing the life sciences industry in Lithuania. And um, Dina brings a lot of business experience, international business experience, which is really great. Uh, like bringing all this knowledge to like governmental sector uh, so, uh, Diana, could you um, introduce yourself shortly? Monica, thank you very much. I think that you made already a very good introduction and uh, I would like to say a big, big thank you to Marissa for such an insightful and exciting and uh, motivating presentation. And actually, uh, in in about two of uh, of weeks, uh, I I've been asked by one. Uh, we have a newly established uh, uh, women university, and they asked me to to give a kind of a lecture about uh, visionary leadership. 
And I like so much, Marissa, I even made my notes about, you know, you said about, about vision, that, uh, that basically you can search for a purpose, but you can also to create it. <laughs> it's so, I think it's so strong. It's, it's a very strong. And uh, coming, coming back to uh, our experience, as Monica said already, I, uh, I had a very long, um, how to say, long career in the business, about 25 years probably in uh, managing also a big corporations in Lithuania. Uh, when I was 28, I was a CEO of, uh, of uh, garment manufacturing uh, factory. Uh, and uh, we employed 1,300 employees. So it was a huge factory uh, according to the, to the Lithuanian standards. And I was 28 and I was a manager and uh, a CEO and I was used always to pretend that I'm older. And uh, yeah, and even being in this position, I was facing strange comments and I was facing even kind of a soft sexual harassment, you know, when you are just treated by your clients or suppliers like saying, oh, such a beautiful woman and, and, and so on. Yes. and. Um, I'm very happy about the situation. My feeling is that it is, it is changing in, in Lithuania and especially with a, with a younger generation. But uh, definitely it's not enough because then uh, we are, our agency is also responsible for, uh, for entrepreneurship promotion. And uh, when we are checking uh, and uh, making a different service, we see that, uh, yes, our women in Lithuania are much, much better educated, actually, but uh, they are much less willing to, 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 to establish their own uh, businesses, especially a businesses, not, not like uh, some SMEs in a very, how to say, we have a lot of uh, micro companies that are based, that, what is basically a single person company to provide just a very basic services like hair cutting or something. Okay, this is, is dominated by them. But going more to the, especially tech, tech companies and the biotech companies, we see here a big difference. The same as we see a big difference uh, in uh, number of, uh, of women in the boards of, uh, of the big companies and CEOs of the big companies. And when we go more further, what are the reasons? And uh, the reasons we see that uh, it's, uh, it's also a different, uh, uh, you know, despite a better education, usually women have a lower self, uh, self-esteem and they, 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 they don't have so, such a big appetite for risk. They're, they're basically, the, the risk appetite is much, much lower than, than men. So actually it's an aim for us in the public sector to think first of all about how to help, you know, to build this risk appetite better with different promotion, promotion tools, with uh, probably some specialized uh, uh, financing funds, with, uh, some, where some benefits would be uh, provided for the, for the women entrepreneurs because the result of the companies established by women entrepreneurs is like a vice versa that you know that uh, not a big part of the women are establishing the enterprises but their enterprises usually are much more successful. Of course, it's also related to the, with the risk, risk taking. But if I would be a, a venture capital investor, I would uh, definitely choose, you know, women entrepreneur established where the women are the founders, the company, because they have basically much better financial results. But it's also not a case. Uh, I seen one report about it was not in, made in the in Lith executed in Lithuania, and I don't remember in, in which maybe US or, or Europe, that basically about investors' um, attitude and how they are making, making their choice. And it was a clear, it was a clear uh, 
a clear advantage of the investors given, given to the men founders, despite that fact that the women founders companies are much better successful financially. So I think it's, it's, a, long, it's a long way to go forward. I also believe that uh, it, is, it is changing now and, uh, and it's, going, uh, it's becoming better. And I would like to encourage all the women entrepreneurs, especially in biotech, because in Lithuania, we have so many women in a biotech. Yes, Monica, it's, I, I think it's a dominated by, by women, like in general, the healthcare. So we need more more businesses here. Yeah, the, the issue in Lithuania is that we have way more women in biotech. First of all, graduating from any uh, to life science related uh, studies and really a lot of women working in biotech companies. However, we calculated uh, the uh, companies and the CEOs, which are women, and uh, we calculated about uh, 50 uh, companies in biotech field at the moment, and only four of them have women uh, CEOs. And so, yeah, it's, it's really a shocking number. And at least my goal is uh, to change it in, in you know, upcoming decade, uh, like in, in, in let to make a major shift that, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, if we have more women in, in biotech graduating or, or at least working in this field, so the same should be in the executive level. So I'm really yeah, and it doesn't necessarily have to just be in the CEO position, but you know, I, I encourage you to look at like this, you know, the other seat positions too, because you know, everyone's not naturally a CEO, so maybe like a COO or a CFO, you know, because that's equally important uh, in the life science field for sure. Yeah, you need, you need, everyone needs a great CFO. So, <laughs> so I think uh, having somebody in finance is really important in this industry too. Yeah, and, and also in, and as in biotech, the CSO, like the yeah. scientific officer, yeah. which is also my really goal that we had more women here uh, leading, you know, the companies. Okay, so I also want to introduce uh, Lena Jankowskaite. Uh, she's a pediatric physician and pulmonologist and uh, with a, a PhD in the field uh, uh, from, uh, not from Lithuania, from Germany. And also, Lena, you have participated in the Women Innovation Sprint and won it with your team. So it seems that you are um, uh, on a different path, like moving more from academia to this entrepreneurial um, life sciences uh, field and, and maybe with some uh, ideas for a, a company. So uh, please, uh, Lena, tell, tell us your story in short. So um, I can actually, I feel you, uh, like each of you, I feel you <laughs> because um, my story is um, same, same, but different, you know, because I think we all share same, but different stories. And, and uh, as I started, for example, medical studies, um, as you already mentioned, uh, healthcare is full of women in Lithuania. However, executive uh, positions or leaders, leaders, I mean, leaders, you know, Lithuanian leader is not a leader by itself. It's a chief. So the chief position is always men most of the time. So I was led always uh, by men most of the times. And um, I heard a lot of things, um, blonde, blue, I, can, I can bake cookies and so on and so forth. Yeah, I can tell you even better stories. Um, then when I went to Germany, because I finished my residentship here, I went to Germany to totally molecular science. I switched the field. And again, I heard that I am uh, Eastern European and so on and so on. <laughs> then I came back here. They told me that, oh, go back to your Germany. You are Germanized. <laughs> uh, you are woman. Don't, uh, don't participate. It's not your business and so on and so on. So um, I am in a lot of fields here in academic, in science and in healthcare. 
I'm a fully functioning physician and definitely sci I, I'm doing, I'm working in regenerative medicine and I'm giving lectures, but uh, it's quite hard uh, to combine these. And definitely for this reason that I cannot, for example, uh, reach some fields very easily because you have, you know, uh, if, if a boss is a man, you somehow need to definitely negotiate network and so on, but you have issues. Yeah, because uh, there are different issues in academics or, for example, even in healthcare. So um, I, I was thinking, okay, Lina, you need to, to do something, you need to do something yours. <laughs> And for, for sure, we participated with a um, few of my uh, group mates, with a few of the girls. This was girl-based group. Um, uh, one, uh, one of the girls was my master's student previously, and uh, we started with her this idea of pain diagnostics. And uh, we developed it uh, to the concept, and definitely we are now searching for partners, for partnership. We have already some partners. And uh, this is like our idea, <laughs> you know, for this reason, we want to, to be more independent in, in, in the thing that uh, we have our own leadership and our own uh, thing, not, um, not somebody telling us what to do. Definitely the way is quite harsh because we are from healthcare. We do not have any kind, we did not have any kind of uh, education in the entrepreneurship or I don't know how to build a company and so on. So we are learning step by step. It's quite hard, it's quite different because we are totally uh, taught different things in medical school, for example. We do not have, uh, nowadays, uh, I am even involved in some soft skill um, um, basis for students in med school, but before we didn't have, you know, what is in like emotional, intellect or uh, teamwork or leadership, what was that? Who cares? Uh, the chief is one and he told you and you have to follow, that's it. Nowadays, it's totally different because even healthcare medicine, even pediatrics, I work in emergency. So uh, this is team-based work, you cannot do alone. So everywhere it's soft skills, everywhere is this leadership, it's important. Networking, as you told, uh, nothing comes alone doing alone and definitely this is and having skills i do agree women have more skills <laughs> most of the times because they struggle to prove something you know even my my partner uh, he's telling me the same that I, I i i want to prove something i struggle so much more than uh, any man um yeah and partnership is very important if your partner is supportive everything is possible if your partner is not supportive, then it's super hard. I, I had one course, so they said, if your partner is not supportive, change your partner. So <laughs> I had luck, my partner is super supportive. So he's supporting in any kind of steps I take. So yeah, complex, complex. Yeah, so uh, I believe that uh, it's about, you know, the support and partnership from uh, everyone around us. Yeah. And uh, yes. I believe especially in, um, well, in, in our uh, culture, this post-Sovietic culture, we still have this uh, sometimes attitude even from the parents that, yeah. oh, yeah. Don't, yeah. don't try too hard, don't, uh, don't show up and uh, yes. don't, why, why are you working so much and uh, you should be more you know with the family you are a woman and so on and so forth so I believe that uh, as Marissa <laughs> told we are uh, growing those you know future uh, mm -hmm. leaders boys and girls and and we really have to change this attitude and really to develop um, support um, among us and uh, you know, my son is after the, all this uh, COVID says that, oh, now I understand mommy, wh what, it, what does it mean to work? So I, I see how it's happening and you really work a lot. So today I allow you to work like 12 hours. If you really need that, I can take care about myself and I will go and play, but if you really need, you can work. So I believe that's a really great thing that our uh, 
uh, children saw how, you know, the real life is happening. So I think mm -hmm. that's great. And I have a question uh, for all of you. Um, uh, so um, maybe starting from uh, Marissa, then to Dinah and Lina. Um, we as women really need more support for each other. And it seems that we sometimes struggle so much that we <laughs> forget to support. Um, so how do you think we could change this uh, aspect of our life? And also in, in your, uh, in your uh, life, have, well, did you have a leader, a woman leader uh, that you really um, aspired and you wanted to be like her or, or to follow uh, the way? Um, because, well, I will share uh, my experience. I had uh, one um, woman in, in, uh, in, in my surroundings that was actually left uh, by her husband with three children and she really uh, managed to grow them and have a great career as a CFO. And I was, I'm, I'm the age of her kids and she was like driving those big SUVs and always like busy but taking care of her kids. And now she's well already um, almost retired from the finance work but still running a, a more like accommodation business near our seaside but still extremely active. And I always thought that if she can do that, then I can definitely do, and even more than she does, because she's so inspiring. So what about you, uh, all this inspiration? Did you have any uh, women leaders you wanted to follow? And really, how can we help each other you know, in our way, in our professional lives? Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, sadly, and I think maybe this is why I am the way I am. I didn't have any inspiring women leaders in the life science industry. Um, there were always those elusive CEOs and C positions, and there was always some leaders of the team, but I, I never, I never had like a, a woman mentor. Um, and, and I missed it. And I, and I think my career suffered because of it. And so I always vowed to get to a position to be that person for somebody else. And that's why I've worked so hard to be able to do that. And so I think we all need to support each other, all of us who have done well in our careers and even who are still growing in the career. I mean, I, I'm not where I wanna be in the future, like there's still more. So I think we all just always need to keep going, but um, we need to be there. There has to be events like this. There has to be uh, ways that we can get together. There has to be open and honest discussions and you know, it shouldn't, Monica, like you were saying before, like it can't just all be good. Uh, we need to talk about the issues that we're having and how to overcome them and, um, and be real as opposed to just, um, you know, putting on this beautiful picture and this is my great life. Um, and we have to be there to discuss it. And, but we also have to be there to support. So when you're building your own companies or your own teams or your own projects or, um, you know, you're working with people, you have to say, hey, why is there no women on my team? Why are there nobody, you know, no women around me? Why am I the only one? And, and advocate for them. So the way that we can have more, you know, women and, and support others is making sure that they're in the room and making sure that they can speak and making sure that they have an opportunity to show how amazing that they are and how smart that they are. And um, whether it's an online forum, whether it's events, whether it's um, all of us just discussing or, you know, or getting feedback. I like to get feedback on things that I'm doing from both men and women. So, uh, you know, uh, having both perspectives is really important. So, um, I think maybe it's because I never had that, that one, you know, that one woman mentor to look up to. Um, mine was always like Sally Ride. She, uh, you know, the, the first woman astronaut. Um, and so I was really excited about her. And, um, you know, she did something exciting and different and was a teacher. And, and that was exciting to me. So I wanted to try to do something like that. Um, but um, I think we, we have to do it together. We have to lift other women up. Um, so that there is this equal space. 
And so that we can give them the opportunity to, to, to in the future, they become the mentors and mentor a younger generation. You don't have to be 20 years in your career to, uh, to be a mentor. You can, you know, even if you're young in your career, then mentor girls in high school or in grade school, um, why they should be in science, why should they should be in math, why should they think differently um, about things. So it comes at all stages. Okay, thank you, Marissa. Dinah, what about you? Oh, it's, it's, so, it's so complicated, you know. I just was thinking, what, what should I say? Uh, no, I did not, I did not have uh, like, you know, an example leader uh, woman I, I would like to follow. I was always learning from, uh, from the man leaders and I was always trying, you know, to, to be better than, than, than they are. Of course, I had a role model leaders. Uh, I had two role model leaders. They were men. Both of them were foreigners. One was, uh, one was Estonian, another was Austrian, definitely not, uh, not a Lithuanian. And I was really lucky that uh, they were, you know, uh, for them it was not, 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 not a, they were not paying attention that I am I'm a woman. So it was really a great role models for me. But what happens with me, you know, when, uh, when I was following this uh, man leadership style for about, uh, for about 15 years, uh, I was very successful. My career was, was really very successful and I man was managing international companies. But uh, at one moment I felt so exhausted. I felt just very, very exhausted because you, you, you were all, I was always trying to be better, to do more, to satisfy everybody, to be strict on agendas, to be strict with the people, to control everything, you know, to, and, uh, and this usual, you know, this uh, male management style. And then I went to a lot of different uh, trainings, coachings, uh, very wide spectrum, starting from uh, Vedas studies, you know, to the personal psychologist. And actually, this personal psychologist, she was she was a lady. It was a lady, and uh, she opened my eyes about emotional intelligence, about everything, and uh, and. Uh, Thanks to her and to all the studies on leadership, religions, and everything, it was such a mix of, of all the practices. I have found and I developed a different leadership style, a different leadership style, which is uh, much less um, exhaust, exhausting for the, for the women, like feminine leadership style, I should say, because we are different from the men. And if we live a way like a man, you know, we can be successful, but we will be drained out very, very soon. But, but we have a lot of capacities, you know, which makes us much better than the man, like emotional intelligence, all the, all our capacities to, to agree, to have a dialogue, intuition and everything. And this, this, all this set can make uh, women leaders a great, great leaders. It doesn't matter with, uh, you know, with what kind of uh, audiences. So I was developing this new, new leadership style. And now, um, now I have a followers, actually. I have a followers. I, I have a, a group of young, young uh, women who, who are in this, in this path. And uh, we are having a regular chats and uh, we are having a regular, regular meetings and I am sharing my experience. I am coaching, coaching them, but I'm coaching them on completely, not completely, but a slightly, okay, a different leadership style than it's written in all the textbooks and this EMBAs, what, what you can get. About more how to use your, your feminine potential in leadership, how to listen to the people, how to use the spirituality in leading a people, how to use the energy of the people to direct towards the company's company's goals and, and company's vision. And then you know, and then you just face much less obstacles in, in this path. 
But of course, you need to have a lot of courage and a lot of uh, self uh, uh, to, to believe in your in yourself, to believe in your capacities. So this is my story. <laughs> Thank you, Dina, very much. And uh, Lina, what about you? Did you have somebody who supported you or who were you following as a woman leader? Um, it's quite hard to tell. Uh, and yes and no. Most of the, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I can agree on that, that I had a role model during my, um, my study years, for example, or during my fellowship um, or during my PhD. I can say that I, in opposite, I learned from bad examples. And those examples showed me what I don't want to be, really. Because uh, uh, some of my chiefs in, in, in previous, previous positions, uh, I was telling myself, no, you won't be as this person. You won't, because they were really bad examples. They couldn't negotiate, they were harassing, not only me, I mean, like a person, but others. Um, they were um, judgmental, um, very, with a lot of prejudice, even, you know? So, um, no, the, the, this was the path I took. <laughs> uh, another thing, definitely, I had my, my family, um, I had quite strong women in my family, and this was quite good support to show how 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 things can go. <laughs> my mother was a leader of a company as well. I mean, of her company. So she she told me she taught me that it's fine, even in the independence years. Yeah, after independence, after Soviet times, you can be a woman leader. You know, so I I, I was taught like that. I I never had. A, for example, I was not, I was never afraid to confront a man or a woman, it doesn't matter. It's not a gender, you know, related. The thing is that um, I do think there, there is a lot of things uh, which can be um, yeah, learned from men and from women, both of them. I learned a lot from my fellowships, which were as well not Lithuanian based, for example, from Belgian style of team leading or leadership, the team was led by a man, but the team was awesome. It, it was, you had, you had no feeling that the man is leading a team. I mean, that he is somehow superior over this group of, of, of people. They were equal. Yeah, he was only administrative unit, I mean. But in general, they were equal professionally. They were equal in team um, manner, in leadership, in creativity in professionalism, everything. And this was my guide, how to do it. Um, and the same, I want to inspire young people, especially in healthcare. It, it doesn't matter on your gender sometimes, yeah? Women should be encouraged very profoundly and they should be and have to be recognized as strong leaders. And sometimes it's not because you are loyal or I don't know, but some of people have better leadership capacities and skills and in general. So why not to choose better instead of telling, no, she's a woman, she's gonna have children, she's gonna, you know, have maternal leave or whatsoever. And a man, yeah, well, it's more stable, but it's not true. It's not true because women are more empathic. They feel better sometimes, really. I, I do feel they can discuss, they can network. They easily ask for help if they cannot do something. Men sometimes struggle to ask for help because well, I can do, it's my ego, you know? Yeah, so I, I do think, yeah. Okay, thank you, Lena. So I think we are going to the very end of this uh, great uh, event today. Um, well, it has to be online, even though the initial idea was to make it live. Uh, so as a, um, Great woman leader Melinda Gates uh, has said, well, we all should look for equal partnership um, well, among our teams, in our family, and uh, of course, in our life sciences industry. And as we had this joke uh, in Lithuania that uh, when we gather, well, the people from the biotech industry, 
we women come together, make a photo and post it as a divas of biotech. And we are recognized in international events as, oh, those Lithuanians, the woman team. So uh, it's our brand, it's our image, and let's keep working on that. And we will have two additional events in this woman biotech. Um, and the next time we will have a woman invest in biotech with Karen Griffin uh, Griga, well, a great entrepreneur and investor in the biotech field. So please come and join us. And I would really like to thank um, all the great uh, participants of today event. First of all, Marissa, thank you very much. You are a great leader and you have people who follow you and who admire you. Uh, and also Dinah, it's really a great thing to work with you and, and really to see how you are pushing the biotech field. Uh, with your uh, governmental agency, but also with the great uh, support. And Lina, also thank you being, you know, one of those future divas uh, of uh, biotech, which we will be definitely seeing in our industry for many years. And uh, once again, Marissa, thank you very much and hope to see you as soon as possible here in Lithuania and also contribute to our uh, great biotech industry. Thank you all. And thank you all for who was listening to us today and hope you all are more, much more inspired after today's event. Thank you and bye. Thank you. Bye. Monica, bye, bye. Bye, bye thank bye. you for having me. Bye.